What is the posture of prayer? The posture is not a, a set of rules on how you ought to do it. The posture is making yourself quiet before God, getting a space that you can block out the distractions, and having moments where you can connect to God the way He created you to connect with Him. All right, so today, the, the, the beginning of this talk, uh, last week we talked about the template. And if you don't have one of these, that we talked about the Lord's Prayer template for use in your prayer life, um, I, there's some in the foyer you can grab later on. But last week the title was the template. Today the title of the message is this, the posture. The posture. What is the posture of prayer? What does it look like? Is there a posture of prayer? Should we be kneeling? Should we be laying? Should we be standing? Should we be have hands folded, eyes closed? Uh, what is the posture of prayer? And I want to get into that today because I think our posture, and it's more than just our physical posture, the posture of our hearts, I think the posture of our prayer life affects the effectiveness of our prayer life. We'll break that down today. So the big idea today is this. <clears throat> Jesus teaches us, the importance of creating space to encounter God free of distractions. Let me read that again. Leave that up on the wall for a little bit so people who take notes can, can take it down. Jesus teaches us the importance of creating space to encounter God free of distraction. Okay? I want to read a, a portion of the book that we've been talking about. Uh, Pray First by Chris Hodges. Now, Chris Hodges, I just want you to know, he is the pastor of, um, oh, it just, it just ran out of my head. Um, you know this, Pastor. Um, church of the Highlands. You know this. Church of the Highlands, this is a church of thousands of people. So we want to know how the pastor of a church of a thousand or like multiple thousands, of, how he prays. I guarantee it's going to be really, like, super different than the way you pray. <laughs> hint, hint, not really. Let me read it. Here we go. Chris Hodges. Most mornings at home, I wake up while it's still dark outside. I've always been an early riser. And even when I change the time zone or switch the daylight savings time, my body seems to uh, awaken just before dawn. Now, I envy that guy. That's not me. I have to force myself. But It usually doesn't matter how late I stayed up just before sunrise. My body, natural uh, alarm clock, signals it's time to wake up. Over the years, I've grown to love being a morning person, especially when it comes to prayer. So this is the formula that Chris Hodges, the pastor of a multi-thousand person church, prays. So I usually wake up while Tammy is still sleeping. Tammy, I'm assuming, is his wife. <laughs> Sunlight begins creeping over the horizon out of our window. I'll head downstairs and make coffee. That's what I'm talking about. Then I head to my office. There's a chair we've had forever with a matching ottoman that has a tear on the corner, which is known as my spot. I'll shut the door behind me because when I pray, I can get pretty loud. First, I'll turn on some instr instrumental worship music and adjust the wireless speaker on the table beside my chair. I love hymns and praise songs with words, but during my morning prayer time, I don't want lyrics distracting me from listening to, God's, uh, listening to God and experiencing uh, my heart, expressing my heart to Him. Excuse me. I want our conversation to be the priority. Then I'll grab my Bible and spend time listening to the Lord speak from His Word. Sometimes I'll drown, uh, it, sometimes in, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes I'm drawn to a particular passage, and other times I go to a spot addressing a specific topic that's relevant to the day. I'll sip my coffee 
and read the day's scripture as slowly as possible, savoring it and letting it sink into my spirit. If a word or phrase jumps out to me from the passage, I'll meditate on it and see what the Holy Spirit might be telling me. After I've read the word and listened to God, then I pray using my selected guide or resource, just like ones I've shared with you in this book, like this, something like this. And he goes on to say he has a bunch of these that he shares in the book, this book. To uh, facilitate my time with God, I keep pens and highlighters handy to jot down anything noteworthy, such as someone I feel compelled to continue praying for or an idea or point for the week's sermon. I move through the prayer time, always including a time of praise for all God has done and worship for who he is. I'll lift up my needs and the needs of my family, close friends, or staff at church, and others in our Highlands family. By the end of my prayer time, usually somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour, I have cracked up, uh, excuse me, not cracked up. (laughs) That's the difference, guys. No, I have cranked up the praise and worship music, and I'm usually singing. Then I'll grab another cup of coffee, praise the Lord, and head upstairs to shower, dress, and get going. Okay, that's Chris Hodges. That's his, that's his thing. But I love the way he adds this last paragraph. Ready? Many mornings when I return to the bedroom, Tammy is up, and in the midst of her own prayer time, she will be sitting in her special chair, reading the Bible, and bowing her head quietly. Sometimes she's whispering in conversation with the Father, and many times she already has a tissue in her hand for the tears that inevitably come. Seeing her so intimately connected to God always moves me. I can only imagine how he feels when she or any of us really open our hearts to him. So that's how... The pastor of a multi-thousand person church prays. It's not rocket science. There's no magical spells. There's no you know, incantations. That you, there's no uh, standing on your head, laying on your back, kneeling in the, you know, loaded, whatever. There's none of that. Do you see that? Do you see it? And then even within his own family, there's a, di- there's a difference between how he does it and how his wife, she's an introvert. She's very much internalizing this thing. She's whispering and she's crying. That's how she connects with God. Do you hear what I'm saying here this morning? What is the posture of prayer? The posture is not a, a set of rules on how you ought to do it. The posture is making yourself quiet before God Getting a space that you can block out the distractions and having moments where you can connect to God the way he created you to connect with him. Please, if you learn anything today, do not look at somebody else and say, I should be doing it that way or that one's better than me because he has a better or she has a better. No, God has created you for a relationship with him. It's not rocket science. If he didn't create you a special way, then there would be a a list of things you need to do. But he created you the way you are to have a relationship with him. So figure that out. How does it work? So here's some principles I want to get to in God's word. Open up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 21. How many people find themselves busy? Anybody? Raise your hand if you've been busy in the last few weeks. I was talking to somebody outside today, and they're like, how you doing, Pastor? I'm like, I am so tired. I'm so tired. I mean, we had, who, oh, we had an awesome time at the Yard Goats game the other night. That was fun. We had a good time. Yeah. Yard Goats killed it. It was an awesome game. We had a fun night. Uh, summer, summer activities are coming to an end, but man, that was a fun night. But we, I've started coaching soccer again. I had, you know, do, being here, staff meetings, doing the things we do, and then 
some of the additional things on top of that, like weddings to plan for. I was, I'm whooped this morning. When I go home, I'm going to get into a catatonic state. Do not call. Unless, like, your house is burning down or your pet dies. Then call. Otherwise, don't call. We're all busy. Life is full. Right? Let me just read you about a normal day in the life of Jesus that uh, emphasizes that he had the same situation that we did. His, his busyness was maybe different than your busyness, but it was busyness nonetheless. Verse 21. They went into Capernaum, and right away he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. They were astonished at his teachings because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like the scribes. Just then a man with unclean spirit was, uh, was in their synagogue. He cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw him into convulsions, shouting with a loud voice, and came out. They were all amazed. And so they began to ask each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You know why that's interesting? I'll just tell you why that's interesting. Exorcisms are not an unheard of thing in this particular time period. People would often bring somebody who had a, with, was suspected of having an unclean spirit to a rabbi, to a priest, and what they would do is they would go through a ritual. They would do all kinds of gyrations and rituals and say special words and anoint with special things. They went through the ritual of exorcism. What does Jesus do? He says, shut up. Get out of here. That's authority. That's authority that comes through relationship with the Father. Do you hear me? There's no special gyrations to Jesus. That He has a direct access to the God of the universe. And he says, shut up. You have nothing to say here. Get out. Goes. Not without a fight, but it goes. Verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, so this is the part of his busy day, right? So far, early in the morning, he, he, he went and he started teaching. He taught for a long time. Then he had this situation with this demon-possessed man. I'm sure that this was energy-draining, busy man. Verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in the bed with a fever, and they told him about it her at once. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. Do you see how normal this is? Say, hey, come on. I need some lunch. Let's go. You're good. Direct access to the God of the universe doesn't require gyrations and rituals. It desires connection with the, the only one who can do these things. See what I'm saying? So, I, look, let's just push a pause here. Sometimes I think we want that. We want there to be some prescribed ritual that makes us look powerful. Jesus, Jesus is the one with the power, and yet he minimizes the optics of his power. Do you see that? He doesn't need that. He's humble. He says, Hey, shut up, get out, and get me lunch. I mean, he's just, he's just, this is the God of the universe. This is who we connect with in prayer. It's humble. It's simple. It's relational. Verse 32. When evening came, after the sun had set. Now, this is a big day, right? Busy day. After the sun had set. They brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door. 
and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. This is the beginning of his ministry. What chapter is this in? This is the beginning of his ministry. So he's telling the, he's telling the demons, yeah, shut up. Don't tell anybody who I am yet. I'm not ready for that. There's going to be a time for me to die, for me to do the things I'm going to do, but not yet. You, you be quiet. Now, I want to jump to verse 35. This is where the busyness is going to meet the discipline that Jesus had, the posture of prayer that Jesus had. Verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to the, des- desert, to the desert place. And there he was praying. He got up. He left the distractions went to a solitary place, a desert place, a, a lonely place, some, verses, uh, some translation called a lonely place, and he spent time praying. So often in our busyness, we think that sleep is actually the, the best remedy. Not necessarily. Sometimes you need to sleep. Hey, can we, anybody say amen now? Sometimes you need to sleep. It's healthy to sleep, Right? Let me ask you a question. Does your sleep, are you working right up to the point that you go to bed? No. How many people spend maybe an hour or two at night watching TV? I know. I won't raise my hand, but yes, you do. (laughs) Here's the thing. There's a lot of things we could subtract from our busyness where we can insert the thing that we really need. See, Jesus didn't need more sleep at that point. He had been depleted spiritually from the busyness of his day. What he needed was to be filled up with the Spirit of God. He needed conversation with his Father. He needed relationship with the one who sustains him more than sleep. What did he say to the part? How many people like to eat? Man, the food at the wedding last night. They actually had a whole tray left over. They're like, Pastor, you want this? I'm like, Oh, I so want that. But the answer is no, because I'll eat the whole tray. Get behind me. <laughs> the idea is that, I mean, here's the thing. What did Jesus say in his other teachings? I have food that you don't even know about. My food is to do the will of my Father in heaven. See, there's things that we need in our lives more than the natural, more than the rest, more than the food. We need connection with the Father. We need that. It's as important to your Christian existence, and I would even say human existence, as food and rest. Yet we prioritize those other things more than prayer. I mean, and I'm not even being judgmental. I've done it too. When I get really busy, I have to to discipline myself to do the things that are good for me. How many gym rats we have in here? A couple of the guys on the right hand. Some of the people who stayed for the uh, 40 and under group last week are the ones raising their hands. The rest of us are like, nah. <laughs> that is so good for your body. But it's a discipline that is often hard to maintain. So here's the thing. Jesus, in his routine, postured himself before the Father regularly so that he could receive from God because he knew it was as vital to his spiritual well-being and his physical well-being as rest and food. Okay. This passage describes the hectic day for Jesus. Let's just recap. It begins with Jesus entering the synagogues at Capernaum and preaching. He teaches with authority. He casts out demons. He goes to Andrew and Peter's house, heals Andrew and Peter's mother. He teaches some more. In the evening, people, the word is spreading, and people are lining up the door for healing, for their physical ailments and demon possession, and he heals many of them. 
No, interestingly enough, it says that, that he didn't heal every single one of them. That's what, Matt, that's what Mark says. Many of them were healed. Most of them. Interesting. Mark 1.35 tells us that at that point, when he got a little rest, he prioritized his time of getting up and having communion with his father. Notice the reasons why. Because once everyone else's day starts, why did he get up early? Once everybody else's day starts, our opportunity to see God in the secret places begins to, uh, begins to compete with the demands of the needs of others. Now, I'm not saying you have to get up early in the morning to do your prayer time and your, and your devotional time. I'm saying it typically is the most convenient, even though it's hard. Why? Mom, any moms in here today? What happens when the kids get up? It's all about them. And it just is. I mean, that's your mom. Once they awake, their needs start to compete with your time. So it's good to carve out some time. If, if you're more of a night person, maybe it's a best thing to do to carve out some time at night after people have gone to sleep. Or maybe, you're, maybe your most quiet time is after the kids have gone to school around lunchtime. Maybe if you're in the corporate world or you're at your job, Maybe the, you have to get up early to get to work. Maybe the best thing to do is to take your Bible to work with you. Sit down in a quiet place at lunchtime. Have your lunch. And don't forget the coffee. Mark describes the time as being still dark. The majority of people had not yet begun their activities. The day was not yet busy. And why is this important? Look at one more verse. Mark 36 and 37 show us just how precious that time was for Jesus. Verse 36. Simon and his companions woke up and they... Just like your kids. Just like your... Mom! Uh. And that's okay. But what, it's demanding. They woke up. They were searching for him. And when they found him, they said, we were looking for you. You weren't where we thought you ought to be. We got stuff. We got questions. We need breakfast. <laughs> right, I mean, we need you. That's why Jesus did this in the solitude. His posture was that of quiet. I don't know if he knelt. It doesn't say. I don't know if he sat. It doesn't say. I don't know if he stood. It doesn't say. But what it does say is that he postured himself in a quiet place so he could focus his attention on the Father. It was a desolate place. Jesus withdrew to a place where no, one other, no other people were or things could compete or distract him from the one thing that he truly desired. Jesus didn't take his iPad and his phone into his prayer time. <laughs> Maybe your desolate place is not just the absence of people, also the removal of things that could detour or hinder your talking with God. I think Satan has a special hotline that he uses when you start to pray. And he starts texting you. Oh, wait, no, that's your mother. No, <laughs> your mother's not Satan. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's uncanny. It's uncanny, the distractions that will arise when you get your, in your space. So guess what? I just, there's this thing called uh, voicemail. If somebody calls you and you're with God, don't pick it up. In fact, don't even bring the phone with you. That direct message, it'll wait. That little ding that says somebody liked your Instagram post, it'll wait. Don't bring things 
into your quiet place that will distract your quiet. Because some things are bad distractions, like silly things, like, you know, checking to see if there's anything new on YouTube that morning. Don't do that before you start your quiet time because you'll get in that loop and you'll start thumbing it. That's a, I, would think that I would put that in the bad aspect. But there's also good things that come that distract. Not every distraction is a bad distraction. Sometimes people are just, hey, I'm pre-. I got a text the other day during my morning time because I didn't do what I'm <laughs> preaching. Um, but I will next time, I promise. The, te- the text message was, hey, I'm praying for you this morning. Well, that's a good thing. But it took me out of my my zone. So I'm trying to do the same thing. One of the problems is it wasn't even on my phone. It was on my tablet. Come on. Sorry, Julie. That was gross. Um, It was on my tablet because my devotional material is on my tablet. And I was like, man, how do I? (laughs) I actually need to read a real book. But that person was just trying to be nice and encouraging. So there's good distractions, there's bad, but they're all distractions. You've got to minimize the potential for distractions. After rising early and finding a quiet place, there he prayed. Jesus, just get this through your head, ready? Jesus prayed. In the busyness of life, Jesus prayed. If Jesus needs to take that time, and he's Jesus, how much more do you and I? We need this. We need this. Maybe it was the form of the Lord's Prayer that we talked about in, the last, in last week. Maybe he used something along those lines. Maybe it was just thanksgiving and worship for all the things that had happened the previous day. Maybe it was deep intercession for others, with his disciples, maybe the people that he would minister to that didn't get healed that day or didn't have demons cast out. Maybe he spent extra time there. I don't know. It doesn't say. Maybe it's just being still and enjoying the presence of God in the quiet morning. Maybe it was prayer for himself for, uh, uh, to be filled up so he can face the day. Or maybe it was a combination of all these things. I tend to think that. But here, let me, let me say this. This is the posture of Jesus' heart. The priority wasn't to check the boxes. The priority of Jesus was being with his Father, being with God. Just as Jesus prioritized his life around making time with God, as his followers, we also need to develop this practice. Jesus teaches us, the importance of creating space to encounter God. Matthew 6, 6 says this. But when you pray, now this is Jesus speaking. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Go into your quiet place and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Greek word here means a room in the interior of your house, normally without windows, openings, or openings to the outside. And in a room, or what we might call a closet. It was a small place suitable for storing. Now, this is in the first century. It was a small place common in first century homes where you would store wine, linens, and other domestic items, but also was used to store valuables or money. This is a place that you went, that you put your values in. The valuable things that you prioritize in your life as valuable, you would put them in this room. And that's where he tells you to go. This is how valuable your connection to God is. This is how valuable this time, this quiet moment with God is. 
This was a common space in the first century home. The original hearers would have quickly associated this room with isolation, solitude, and value. Now, this talk is a prequel. Before Jesus teaches us the template of the Lord's Prayer, he first teaches us the posture of prayer. Jesus encourages us to take time to enter into an inner place where we can close the door. Close those doors in your mind. We must not only create a quiet place, but we also cultivate a quiet heart before God. Solitude and silence not only refer to alleviating outside disturbances, but also inward noise and interruptions. How many people have had the moment where they sit down to try to pray and their mind just starts racing about the day? Anybody ever have that problem other than me? You guys are way more holy than me. Yeah. I do that. I sit down or I spend some time in prayer and I'm trying to focus on, on praying and my mind just goes on this reel of things that need to get done. People I should be calling. Uh, the worst part of being a pastor is in these moments where you're trying to connect with God, you're writing sermons in your mind. It's like, no, no, stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Focus on God. This is the tendency of our crazy world, this, this, this nonstop media culture that has gotten us so fast and so buzzed that it's hard for us to shut our brains down and focus on one thing. That's why I think, like Chris Hodges, he puts on some music. I find that to be helpful as well. Not, like I said, instrumental music. Sometimes when we have prayer here at the church, we'll actually put on some, some instrumental worship music just to kind of fill the space because we, we, we are so uncomfortable with silence. Do you realize, you know, have you ever noticed that? We are so uncomfortable with silence. Anyway. Jesus encouraged us to take time to enter into an inner place where we can close the doors, right? We must also, uh, we, must only, we must not only create a quiet place, but we also must cr- cultivate a heart of quietness before God. Solitude and silence are vitally important to drown out the noises. Next, Jesus tells us to reward, that he rewards our prayer time with being there. I think sometimes we read this passage like he rewards those who pray in the secret place. And we're thinking, okay, my prayer, if I do this formula and I get into a quiet place and I posture myself in a a particular way, then what I ask for is going to be given. God's going to reward me and give me the things I pray for. Let me just tell you right now, if that's the posture that you're going into prayer with, don't expect anything from God. It's not about your stuff. It's about connection and relationship with the God of the universe. Now, God is a good father, and he will, he will bless his children. But stop looking at, the, uh, at prayer as a magical potion or a r- rubbing the genie. We have to stop that. What is God rewarding us with? He says, I'm rewarding you with my presence. I will be there. In fact, I'm already there. The Father is already in the secret place. He has gone ahead of you, and he's waiting for you. The moment you get to the secret place, you are in the immediate presence of your Father, and he rewards you with not standing you up. Like Jesus, the priority for us in prayer is being with our Father. Prayer is inviting God into our circumstances, into our hopes, into our fears, into our dreams, into our pain. Prayer is not working our way through uh, a grocery list of requests that we desire God to perform or answer the way we expect Him to. Prayer always is to live Prayer, uh, prayer allows us to live relationally with God. 
You think God doesn't know your stuff? That like you're, you're going to like unpack all your needs and he's going to be like, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> well, of course, you came into the closet, so you're going to get it. You get it. You get it. You, you know. No, that's not it. When, he, when he's already in that place and he's waiting for you and he's there and he, and he rewards you with his presence, he's not shocked when you tell him you need something. He's not taken by surprise by your de- depression. He's not affected by your need. This is the God of the universe. He's got all the resources you need. And he wants to have relationship with you and walk through those things with you. Prayer allows us to live relationally with God. Living relationally means you can learn to talk to God and listen to God and think about God through, throughout your day. As you walk throughout your day, as you wake up in the morning, as you take a shower, drive to your next destination, work diligently at the place of employment, go on a walk, or relax in your favorite place of rest. You can, this, this time of prayer, this solitude, primes the pump for a relational dialogue between you and God all day long. Remember, if, you, if Jesus was busy, think about your busy life and how you, if you want to follow Jesus' example, need to prioritize this type of thing. For us today, these distractions include people, distractions include email, social media, and cell phones. Leave them away. Find a place. Uh, Chris Hodges has his chair with the rip in the ottoman. My place is on the left-hand side of my living room couch with a fireplace to the left. I don't put it on the summer, but fireplace. My, all, my, all my study materials are right in the coffee table in front of me, and there's a, a little coaster there for my you know, coffee. And that's where I go. Right, AJ? Yeah, she knows. She comes down in the morning. Where's dad? Sitting right in that spot. Right in that spot. Most days. I'll be honest. So let's conclude this teaching with a very practical uh, exercise for you to do this week. Set a posture of prayer in your heart and in your environment. Set a posture of prayer. Number one, when you get home from your service, from this service, get out your calendar or journal and set a time and a place. Set a time and a place. Designate a time and place to pray that is quiet and distraction free. Only you can know what that room looks like in your life. Mine is not a closet. Mine is not kneeling. Mine is sitting in the most comfortable place that I can find in my house, and I've realized that I have to sit up. If I lay back in that chair, so I sit up, and I have my coffee and my, and my notes right there, and then I spend time, very similar to what Chris does, I spend time reading God's Word, studying God's Word, and then I go into a time of prayer. And I, I have done... Like many of you have done this week, I have used, all week I've used this as my template for prayer. And man, it's amazing. I was, I was excited about giving it to you, but then when I started like really using it, I was like, man, this, this offers a lot of opportunity for prayer. I found myself spending way more time uh, in prayer with that temple. So I encourage you. And then if you, if you pick up this book, there is more, more templates, which are great. Number two. Set a goal. So set a place, set a goal. Daily is ideal, but if that's too much, shoot for three times a week for 10 or 15 minutes 
If you really get into it, I guarantee 10 to 15 minutes won't be enough. But here's the, here's the rule of thumb. Shoot for something that feels a little challenging, but doable. Something a little challenging, but doable. Spend some time. If Jesus needed it, I guarantee you needed it. You need it. I need it. So let's land this sermon. Ready? By entering into the secret place, free from people, email, media, other distractions, you can encounter the Father and invite him into your circumstances. Invite him in. Your hopes, your fears, your dreams, and your pain. It's a relational moment for you to be with God and have a, a moment of strengthening. Remember we talked a little while back about the bigness of God? How the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We realize how big God is, and that's, a, that's kind of a fearful thing. But then when we turn the thing around and realize that that big God is on our side, that fear turns to confidence very quickly. That's what a time of prayer, of sharing your life with God, of, of, of bringing him into your circumstances does to your day. It changes it from daunting to courageous. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you bow your heads? God, I thank you so much that you want, why do you even want this from us? That you want to have a relationship with us. That's, that's an amazing thing. God, you've designed us to need a relationship with you, to fill us up, to, to tackle the, the life that you've called us to, to, to tackle the, the responsibilities that we have with family and work and all the things that bombard us throughout the day. We need to be filled up with your Holy Spirit. We need that relationship with the powerful God who loves us. So God, I pray that my brothers and sisters today would take this teaching from your word and start to integrate it into their lives. Is my belief that their life will be so much better for integrating this into their routine. God, teach us how to pray. Lord, increase our prayer time. Yes, yeah, sometimes it might even feel a little awkward just resting in your presence and and listening. But God, you want to speak. We'll get into that in a future sermon. But Lord, thank you that you want to, that you're actually already there and you never stand us up. So Lord, we ask you to put it on our hearts to build this discipline into our lives. Lord, thank you for your power and your presence and your desire to love us in a relational way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.